Where did you decide, for example, just to take one example, to this interesting, um, uh, almost symbolic use you have of, of cool colors and warm colors? Uh, you know, that happened in Kronos. That, that, that I was doing Kronos with Guillermo Navarro, and then we did a shot. It's a low-angle shot of Jesus Greece opening uh, the diary of the alchemist, and he had a warm light on the left and, and uh, a very cold, cool blue on the, on the right, and I saw that contrast, and I can't explain it. I just went, this is so beautiful. Yeah. I fell completely in love with it, and I've been then codifying color ever since, and, and it came from, it actually was very clear, and I was already codifying, for example, red. In, in, in Kronos, I didn't want red in anything but things that meant life. Blood, uh, the little granddaughter of Jesus Greece, and, and everything was blue and everything. But it was very rudimentary, but uh, it came from a, a quote uh, that, that Fellini did. He said, when one transitioned from silent to sound, one made the point of working the sound as an expressive tool as a narrative tool. And he says, and when I went from black and white to color, I made a point to codify the color as a narrative uh, tool. And I thought that that is true, every single, and if you watch somebody that encompasses the entire history until modern cinema, like Alfred Hitchcock, you see how he uses every single tool that lands on his lap. You know, the translucent ceiling on the, on the lodger, you can, there's nothing on film that, in my opinion, can be casual. The type of film I want to do, I want to codify everything. Again, when I was a little kid reading about schools of painting, medieval painters and the symbolists both filled their paintings with symbols. And you, you know, when I when I go with my kids to a museum, of course you can look at the picture and it's powerful and it's beautiful. But then I try to discuss it a little bit of reference about who painted it, why. And for example, you know, when we see a painting of Susan and the old and the elderly, or uh, Leda and the swan, or Polyphemus and Galatea, you know, it, it's helpful to know the myth. If you explain them that Polyphemus is a, a jealous Sicilian Cyclops, it explains a lot of things on the painting. And, and, I, and I think that there is, in film, uh, I think that we, see film, silent film evolve, and you see the tools being built, and then you see it reach an absolute apex, you know, absolute perfection. Von Stroheim's Greed, Cha Chaplin City Lights, Keaton the General, uh, Murnau, Dreyer, you know, they, they become true visual essays. Like if you decompose Vampire, uh, thinking about uh, the idea of it being a memento mori, you can make sense of it, but you're you're truly dealing with symbols and images which are polyvalent and and very strong, and that discourse when sound came, comes in, uh, it re re superimposes a structure that existed from the early days that came from theater, which is dramaturgy, which is the script, the plot, the characters, and there is now. Uh, a more complete work and a more complete form in many ways, but the discourse uh, often just refers to that element. Yeah. And, and in many ways, we still dis discuss films without taking into account the melodic, musical, rhythmic uh, color. You know, when you discuss a painting, you discuss the strength of a stroke. Is it a single stroke? You know, is, is Picasso detailing the, the body of the bull? In, in a single stroke, is that is masterful? Is it a series of strokes? Is it punctiism? You know, it, it, there is a plasticity to film that is a language in itself at its best that I think should be discussed in those terms. So uh, it's, 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 it's a love of, of it that I think changes after silent cinema. But silent cinema, to me, I see greed and, and is a perfect Amazing. masterwork. Amazing.